Good evening everybody. This is Steve talking to you from the backyard with the crickets and the uh, candlelight and the waterfall effect in the background and trying really really hard to uh, deal with life on life's terms right now and understand that you know no matter how much work we put in as real progressives trying to um, you know, get you guys our assessment. It's not like, you know, we're, we're just trying to give you the best we got. You know what I mean? And sometimes when you're doing this round the clock, you wear out. You get a little bit thin-skinned. You get a little bit, I don't know, frustrated sometimes. And then you get the troll that comes by. They've got 15 minutes on their hands and they want to just sort of they just want to say something, you know? And usually I don't give a crap. Usually I let you guys handle it because I've got bigger fish to fry. You know what I mean? It's like I used to let that crap bother me. And then I said, no, I'm not going to let it bother me. Because trolls abound, right? But tonight I got really, really pissed off. And I wanted to talk about it because I think it's important that we all understand... Um, you know, we're, we're all human beings, right? And this campaign has been really tough on all of us. Um, and when I post something, when we post something, we're posting it not as trolls. We, we really mean what we're doing. We're really trying very hard to make sure that we're putting out, you know, important stuff. And we try to screen it. We try to make sure we don't use crappy sources. Uh, we try to make sure that, um, I mean, we, we love Bernie Sanders, so we're not sitting there bashing Bernie, but yet we have these bleeding hearts that come in here and they don't take the time to read the articles. They don't take time to notice that, hey, I didn't say those words. I took a snippet from the article and posted it in there. They think, oh my God, you said something bad. It's like, it's just the article, folks. It's just a freaking article. Calm down. Relax. But no, we've got these people, they're all, you know, you're, stop bashing Bernie, stop, don't bash Bernie. Bernie's, Bernie's been taken on a whole lot worse than anything we might say, because we love the man. I mean, even though he, you know, whatever, right? We, we know the deal. But we're not bashing Bernie. We, we haven't, you know, we, we, we're supporting progressives, so we've gone ahead and we're trying to support Jill Stein, right? Today, I sat there and read the riot act, if you will, about the Green Party not being accessible for everyone. It's, it, it, it hasn't opened the tent big enough for everybody, right? So, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm voting for Jill Stein. I'm telling you, I am fighting and campaigning for Jill Stein. But I am also telling you, I want them to be successful. So, I'm not one of these people that can't say something negative about my home team. I'm a Washington Redskins fan. I mean, do you know how many times I cuss on a Sunday afternoon? I mean, serious, I'm a Washington Capitals fan. Do you know how many playoff series I end up choking myself to death because these guys end up choking and losing in the first or second round? I mean, I do that about my political people too because I want them to be successful. And I want to be a part of that success in whatever way I can. So we put out something about Bernie Sanders getting a lake house. And I just took, you know, you know how these moronic media things have everything broken up in pictures and ads and all this crap. Well, I just wanted to put a nice snippet in there, which was the intro to, you know, to take, give you a taste of the article and put it out there so that you guys could read it and discuss it. Well, I took the first section of the article before it went to the picture. And guess what? It didn't tell you, the little snippet I took out, didn't tell you that they were able to get the house with inheritance money. It didn't say it. So naturally, we're trolls. And people are tired of this page being trolly against Bernie. My God, it's like, banned! And I felt bad about it. I'm telling you all, I'm telling you, I felt bad. I banned the person because I just wanted to... 
But it was like, you know, that's me because I'm tired. I'm exhausted. You all are probably exhausted too. And when I see somebody that's lazy when it comes to the stuff we post, if you know how much time we put into it, whatever. No, I'm used to it. But when you see somebody come in here and tell us that we're anti-Bernie, it's like, are you freaking nuts? I'm anti-Hillary, I'll tell you that, in spades. But I'm not anti-Bernie, not even by a long shot. So... It's frustrating when you've got these troll burgers who are supposedly good people that come in and they're, hey, you guys need to whatever, right? So then we post a judicial watch video, a live stream. Now, I grew up during the Clinton era, and I was very much against Clinton back then. I was a Republican way back. As I've talked about it before, you know, I mean, I, I hated the Clintons, but I hated them for all the wrong reasons. Now I hate them again. But as a progressive, you know, over the course of 20 plus years, you change, you become a different person, your experience, your life, everything changes. But the thing about the Judicial Watch video was that they spoke about a FOIA request. They went to a judge and they said, damn it, release the emails. Now, I don't like Judicial Watch. I don't read Judicial Watch ever because usually their stuff, when they have editorials, it's slanted, it's crap, so I don't read it. There's a lot of things I don't read that some of you all probably read. I don't. I don't like nonsense. But when you're sitting there telling me that you've got honest to God, here's the emails the judge released, I'm going to listen. And I'm going to put it out there because we're talking about facts. We're not talking about an op-ed. We're not talking about a blog. We're not talking about anything like that. So nothing they said violated anything that hurt my heart. And I don't need to protect the Clintons because, quite frankly, I think they're a cancer. And I think they are an enemy of America. And I think that people that get this weird sensation to protect the Clintons are obviously not on the same wavelength as real progressives because we are actively campaigning against them. Like, write it down, remember it, straight up. We are actively fighting against the Clintons. They've stolen our election. Since the 90s, they've destroyed the country with their neoliberalism and bringing the Democratic Party far to the right. They have done this. This is their baby. This is what they've done. So, no, I'm not defending the Clintons. And I'm not rooting for Trump. Fancy that. That's another one of those things that just makes you want to just... No, just because I'm against the Clintons does not mean I'm pro-Trump. Anyway, so let's, let's talk a little bit about the Clintons for a minute, even though we talk about them an awful lot. You go back into the 90s, and, you know, Clinton was trying to prove to his right-wing friends that he was tough on crime. So he took a guy named Ricky Ray Rector and decided he was going to make an example of Ricky Ray. And he put him in the death penalty and sat there and enjoyed it, bragged about it even. Ricky Ray Rector had tried to kill himself after committing a horrible crime. He committed a horrible crime. There's no question he is guilty. But when it came time for his sentencing, the man was a vegetable. The man had blown his brain. He was, he was lobotomized. The man was not fit to stand trial. And as someone who is adamantly opposed to the death penalty, watching Brother Bill try and get his conservative credentials intact by executing a mentally handicapped man should have been the first indicator of what was to come but it got swept under the rug. I mean, Billy could play the saxophone. He could build a bridge to a new tomorrow. He could feel your pain. Then it just kept going. Little by little, you know, you had the Republican Revolution, you had the whole contract with America, Newt Gingrich and all that stuff. And then you had the witch hunt, you had Whitewater. And you had all this nonsense. And back then, even I felt like, ooh, this is kind of like, 
like a witch hunt. It's gross. But over and over and over again, there was always lies being told. And, and people would make excuses for him and everything. And mind you, you know, at the time, I went to a place called McLean Bible Church. And Ken Starr actually went to the church with me. And I remember sitting there with my ex-wife one day. And I looked back behind me. And there was Ken Starr sitting behind me. And I wrote on the, the thing. I was like, oh my God, Ken Starr is sitting behind us. And I showed it to her. Well, little did I know, I set the thing down in my chair when I went up to sing and whatnot. And he saw it. And he laughed. And it was a chuckle. We went to a father-daughter dance later on, and he introduced himself, and every and at the time, like I said, I was a Republican. So it was like, yeah, you get that man, you get him. Well, I felt like a heel after, you know, later. But the reality is, is that that was all that Bill Clinton had done was like, you know, gotten a BJ in the Oval Office. You know, I, it wouldn't have been good, but, uh, you know, it would have been like, oh, whatever. He did kind of use his authority with an intern, which in any other circle would have gotten you fired, right? So, sorry, I had a little break in the connection there. But you think about that, and it's like, you would have gotten fired for it. I would have gotten fired for it. Any one of us would have gotten fired for it. So, why is he special? Eh, whatever, right? Not a big deal. It's not killing people. It's not whatever. But he made up for that, right? He, you know, he went ahead and signed into law the crime bill, the 94 crime bill. And that crime bill was the impetus behind all the mass incarceration. Now, some will say that it started before that. The fact of the matter was, is that Bill Clinton took what should have been the opposition party to that and took them and put them clearly, squarely into Republican territory. That right there signaled the bull weevils had taken over the party again the dixiecrats were in charge and that has not changed since you've had moments where there'd be a little bit of a liberal something going on but for the most part the new democrat has come into power and that right there started with bill clinton it's, there was some other stuff with jimmy but i'm not going there i'm really worried about bill clinton so after he got through his crime bill and, you know, she said, you know, it's a really smart and thoughtful, well thought out bill. Um, I bet she would like to take that back, but it really doesn't matter because no one's holding her accountable for that still to this day. Anyway, so then a little bit later, he's sitting there, uh, you know, hobnobbing with his newfound Wall Street buddies and everything else. Sidney Wheel, uh, you know. Had, was a buddy of his from Wall Street, and was telling him, yeah, man, you got to help sign away this Glass-Steagall, blah, blah, blah. So what does Bill Clinton do? He signs the omnibus package that had the Glass-Steagall removal. Some people say it was already gutted, but nonetheless, it was the symbolic death knell that Bill Clinton signed in the law. You know what Bill Clinton did? He gave that pen that he signed it to, to that Wall Street robber baron. He gave it to that crook, Sidney Weil. W-E-I-L, I believe, is the spelling. And they had pictures taken together and everything celebrating the repeal of Glass-Steagall. They did. He did. He, and he, he celebrated it, right? Then he talked about making government efficient. We're going to make government small. Well, what he did was, in essence, austerity. He cut spending. He limited the amount of money going into the economy. Now, you guys know I can go on a ramble about the economy, but I'm going to keep it away from that because even though that's touching on this, it's not really what the point of it is. So while he went ahead and decided he was going to, you know, renovate the government, he was going to fix it, right? He had what they call a disruptive technology going into place. And that disruptive technology was the commercial instance of the internet. The internet, you know, uh, ARPANET, all that DARPANET and all that good stuff had been around, you know, since the 60s and 70s. So it wasn't new, but the commercial iteration, the commercial utilization of the internet began in Bill Clinton's era. And then the joke, of course, that Al Gore created the internet. Um, but that right there, that disruptive once in a generation technology covered up a lot of the ills of Bill Clinton's austerity measures. But then something happened. Around 98, 99, 
things started shifting a little bit. You're getting up for Y2K. All the IT investment was going berserk, trying to retrofit. I don't know if any of y'all remember this. I was in IT, so I remember. But they had the two-digit year code instead of the four-digit. So all the IT programmers are in there digging up the old COBOL code and stuff, and they're, you know, they're updating this this date. And everybody was scared to death that all the computers were going to come crashing down. It's a big deal. Well, all of a sudden, all these companies that were propped up didn't have a single customer, not a one customer, some of these places, like walkingthedog.com. All these dot-coms just out of the blue, right? There was all this venture capital going everywhere. People were getting money for nothing, man. They were building these huge networks. Everybody was freaking getting fat and happy. Cisco stocks were through the roof. Everything was like, wow, man, we are living la vida loco, man. This is like Camelot. And I was in sales at the time, so I was really, really loving life for a little bit. Traveling all over the country, getting to see the world, five-star restaurants, you name it. All over the country. Lots of time in Los Angeles. Got to really enjoy my life, right? And then it came to a... Cr I started seeing it before everyone else because I was in the IT industry. As the IT industry started consolidating and all those ISPs, if you remember all the millions of ISPs that used to exist... They all started consolidating. All of a sudden, you had your PSI Net Stadium where the Ravens play. All of a sudden, PSI Net, which had been cobbled together by a hundred different ISPs and never integrated, they went boop, boop, bye, gone. And then AOL started vetting out. They just started going crazy. And all these different dot coms going down the drain, left and right and center. So I jumped ship, got out of the ISP markets. But that was when Bill Clinton left the White House and went over to W. And we already know the story about the election, so I won't talk about that right now. But the point is, Bill Clinton was kind enough to give the jackass W a recession because the dot-com bubble burst. That was a Bill Clinton machination. And then all the austerity, all the cutting government, all the trimming the fat and everything else came home to roost. And it wasn't the W tax cuts, because remember, folks, repeat after me, Federal taxes don't fund spending. So that wasn't what it was. What it was, was austerity. Government had decided that it would suck the money back. It deleted that stuff. It didn't end up getting it back into the economy. And all of a sudden, wah guess what? We have 9-11, and I am definitely not touching 9-11. I'm not going to do it. Yeah. Hey, what about those secondary explosions? No, not going to touch it. Um, but in any event, that recession hit. And who was in fault? Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton. He celebrated reducing government. He celebrated all this stuff. Now, I know some of you guys say, oh, yeah, you know, it should be efficient. Should be, yeah. But the reality is, is that when your economy is built based on a sovereign currency, cutting spending is stupid as it's stupid. It's stupid. There's no redeeming value in it. But he did it because he was appealing to his right-wing buddies. They were trying to grow the Democratic Party, but to the right, not bringing the disaffected people on the left. Because, as you've seen, they make it difficult to vote, and the poor people have more pressing needs, like eating or finding a blanket to cuddle in under a park bench, rather than voting. So what do you have? Hey, who's going to make it to the polls? Maybe there's wealthy guys that you know, don't have to ask for a day off. They just take the day off. They can go vote. We'll work with them. They got the money. They'll keep dumping it into my campaign. That's where we'll go. So voila, you've got the W era. Everybody loved W at first. Hillary voted for his wars. All the different, she tried to set us up for freaking making it impossible to default like on credit cards and bankruptcies and trying to make it really tough because personal responsibility. Okay, so we had all this stuff, her little meddling in the uh, Senate. She what she got a couple roads renamed. She did nothing in the Senate, nothing whatsoever, but she fattened her purse. She made lots of connections. She grandstanded, she carpet bagged from Arkansas up to New York. And then all of a sudden they started the preparation for the coronation. 
she was going to be the first woman way back then. Way, way back then they were planning this stuff. So what do we got? We got her all of a sudden negotiating how she's going to be president in 2016 back in 2008. Back when Obama kicked her butt. You had a situation where all the press was put onto a plane. They were taken off with the expectation that they would have Obama with them. But in reality, Obama and Hillary were out somewhere else discussing their plans and how this handoff would occur way back then. And remember, Obama said she'll say anything and change nothing. He called her Annie Oakley. There was all kinds of stuff he called her up. He pretty much hit her in the mouth too, and rightfully so. Now, Obama turned out to be a pretty fraudulent dude. He's a new Democrat just the same. You know, thank you, Obama, for breaking the barrier for race. But you're a new Democrat, too. You're a neoliberal, Obama, and you're a neocon. But regardless of that, this is about the Clintons. So the Clintons, once again, paved their way to get to the top. And in the meantime, their foundation, <coughs> their foundation comes to play. And they use all their connections, all the Secretary of State stuff. You know, she, she gets in there and she starts shucking and jiving. And she made a lot of promises. A lot of promises that she would not use the Clinton Foundation or partake in that stuff while she was Secretary of State. She, it's a, there's a letter that says that she promised she would, that was the agreement. The Clinton Foundation would not have access to the office of the Secretary of State. And yet now, the same email or the same post from Judicial Watch that we put up earlier that shows, in fact, that she did with her girl, Yuma, okay, they actually did exactly what they said they wouldn't do. And they peddled out favors from the Secretary of State to the Clinton Foundation. And it's documented. We're not even talking about like conspiracy at all. This is not like, I wonder if they did it. No, it, they did it. They did it. And they have dullards. I mean, stupo dullards. Even today, that are saying, that's a right wing smear. No, it's a truth deal. It's all about truth. It's just truth. It's a truthy thing. And if truth is going to suddenly be equivalent to a right-wing smear, you're really setting the stage for some bad stuff. You don't want that to be the case. You want truth to be truth, period. You don't want it to be a partisan deal. You just want it to simply be truth. Was that the email, yes or no? Yes, it was. Okay, it's not a smear then. But didn't the Russians hack the DNC? I don't care. Did the emails say what they said? Period. Yes or no. Did you conspire against Bernie Sanders? Yes or no. Yes, we did. Okay, that's it. I don't care if it was, uh, you know, Reagan from the dead. I don't care if it was Putin. Hell, I don't care if Nixon found a way to go, I'm not a crook and did it. It's either true or it's not true. And it was true. So, I don't care if it was a right-wing group that found it. Sometimes the enemy does our work for us. Why is that? Well, let's get to my favorite subject, the why I'm never Hillary. As a real progressive, and I mean, folks, I mean, I am, I'm like ready to go friggin' big gov, I mean, full on socialism in my mind, on it, but, but I won't go that far. I'm just gonna say, bottom line is, I am not a righty. The Clintons have absolutely stolen this election from us. And we've proved it time and again. And there's more proof coming out every day. It's like a constant thing. And yet there's people sitting there telling us that if we don't fall in line with Clinton, that we are somehow or another right-wing trolls. Whatever, man. If that's your definition of a right-wing troll, you got real issues. And I'm not so sure that Facebook is something you should be on. 
Maybe you should be in re-education camps at your FEMA camps. Maybe you should be in a FEMA camp, you know? The truth should not be equivalent to a right-wing smear. I can tell you right now, when the right wing brings a snowball into Congress to talk about climate change, then you can tell me it's a right wing smear. That's ridiculous. But truth is an email. Here's an email. And again, who cares if it was Putin? Who cares? They're doing God's work if they're producing truth. But back at the ranch, if Clinton gets in the White House again, the same people that think everything that has been said about her is a right-wing smear, those same people will do that for the next four to eight years, too. Every single freaking scandal those parasites do will be dubbed a right-wing smear. There will be no accountability. Look at John Lewis. That man shamed himself. If I could see him face to face, I would look him in the eye and say, you, sir, are a charlatan, man. You are a snake. Don't you remember the fight you used to be in? Would you arrive? What are you, John? Let me pull the ladder up behind me, Lewis. You were stumping for Hillary. You weren't stumping for truth. You weren't defending your people. You were defending a shill. You, sir, are a shameful man at this point in your career. You have forgotten what it's like to march with King, to do the civil rights stuff you once did. You, sir, are a hack, a fraud, a sham, a waste. You have wrecked something trust has been bestowed upon you, sir. And you have decided to throw it away by defending a shill instead of seeking truth for the people you claim to be the gatekeeper for. The voice of a nation. You are the voice of the African-American community. I beg to differ, sir. We don't have white leaders. There's no need for blacks to have black leaders. African-Americans are free to make their own choices, sir, and you don't speak for them. Trust me, I know. Thank goodness for our team and the people that tell me the score. They give me the straight dope from the other side, a side that I'll never be able to feel, a side that I'll never understand directly. But I got straight skinny from people who live the life in Southeast D.C. and elsewhere. And I tell you what, it's a beautiful thing to open your mind. And John Lewis, he's given you the okie doke. And that okie doke is what you can expect the Democratic Party to do every single time that Clinton fucks up. Excuse my Francais. Every time Clinton does something wrong, every bomb she drops, everything she does, there'll be a Democrat there to make an excuse for it. That level of unaccountable governance is unacceptable for a progressive who is looking to change the world, who is looking to get corruption out of our government, who is looking for a leader like Bernie Sanders, who is ready to take the fight to the 1%, who got bowled over by cheating, lying, fraud, theft, by the Clintons, the same people that some of you might support. And I hope to God you don't. Because every bit of her fraud is on your shoulders, buddy. But at you support her, every death is yours. Every fracking well that goes wrong, every polluted water is yours. Every dead Syrian is yours. Every dead Libyan is yours. Every dead child from a missed drone strike is yours. That's the way it goes, and that's how I roll, and that's what I'm talking about. The blood's on your hands. There is no such thing as a passive vote. It's yours. So going back, looking at all the scandals, looking at all the lies, the verifiable lies, even now, she, even now she's tripling down on the Comey stuff. Well, he said I was perfectly honest. Even now, those parasites are not calling her to account. Even now. So, how can you live knowing that every freaking day is going to be a freaking convoluted management mess of a lie? They're going to cooperate. They're going to collaborate in building the lie. And you have a choice of whether you eat that shit sandwich 
or whether you reject it. We've got a huge track record of Clinton to look at. And I assure you, once you pull the nonsense out of your ears, the fake, oh, it's a right-wing smear, you start asking yourself, how in the world are these people supposed to be supporting feminism when they crap on women who are claiming to have been sexually assaulted, abused, talked terribly to, um, disrespected, etc. How in the world can you claim to care about feminism? H help a brother out. I don't get it. How can you claim to care about black lives yet be willing to jail people for marijuana? How can you do any of those things while sending the poor to war? Now think about it. Somebody came into the inbox earlier today asking me, well, you know what, I love your videos, they're very inspirational and stuff, but what about the college debt stuff, right? I don't think people should get away with getting rid of their college debt because my friend who worked three jobs and had to miss her kids, she didn't get that help. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, that reminds me of when I was a Republican, that whole Calvinism thing. And this person, he paid me a huge compliment. And I'm not here to punish him. That's why I'm not going to mention his name because I don't, I just don't think he gets it. I don't think many people get it. But the fact is, just because I had a rough time carrying a bag of ice up 50 flights of stairs doesn't mean we want to build an elevator. What the hell, man? When you know something is broken, you fix it. Student debt bubble is our next big crash coming up. The housing bubble was there first. The difference with the housing bubble is you could file bankruptcy and walk away from your mortgage. You cannot walk away from your student loans. And if you defer them, let me tell you something. I deferred my student loans for four months. It tacked on $17,000 in deferment charges. That's called usury. It's unbelievable. So, why would you want to continue that because one person or maybe five people or a hundred people did it really tough. They worked really hard and they had to struggle through. So everybody should always struggle through because we can't have it better anymore for anybody else. It's, it's that stuff that made me become a lefty. That's what changed me from being a Republican was that just logic fail. It's like if you know it's not working, fix it. Fix it. And then Clinton and her Calvinism wants to make it only for families up to $125,000. Now, that sounds good because you can hate the rich and stuff like that. But what about the families who have been divorced and... Maybe they have a house that's upside down that they got when they were married and they are living less than paycheck to paycheck and the hole is getting deeper. And all of a sudden, the kid, because it's the kid we're talking about, not the parents, the kid is now judged by mom and dad making over 125000 a year. And so now they're screwed. Now they're carrying that debt. I'm really sorry. I hope that the uh, I hope that the connection works better. It, you know, it, it comes and goes. I'm so sorry, um, but the fact is, we, as a nation, have got to stop doing it by needs based and start going by citizens' benefits. So we stop dividing each other. Why divide? Why? 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 We're monetarily sovereign. Your taxes don't fund spending. So why in the world would you do it? So let's just say, hypothetically, Donald Trump is a parasite, is an asshole, he's a jerk, he's an idiot, a loser, a microphone abuser, and doesn't want to pay for his kids' college. His kids. Now, mind you, Donald Trump's the rich guy, not his kids, let's say. So you're okay with telling those kids to suffer because their dad's a jerk. That's not very progressive of you. That's not very progressive at all.
It's stupid. Kids should not suffer for the sins of their parents, and they should not suffer for the victories of their parents. They should not be judged by the basis of their parents' accomplishment. They should be judged on their own merit, period. Donald Trump's kids, the minute they start saying stupid things about birther stuff and everything, then his kids are judgeable. But until then, they're just kids, right? Think about that. Stop trying to make things difficult on Americans. Stop heaping crap on the poor. Stop worrying about the stuff because we can get a lot more done if we stop trying to be punitive. Stop trying to hurt people. Stop trying to exact revenge. And that's what Clinton is doing. Clinton is saying, we'll do it for some people. And that way the person at 126000 a year, not 125, 126, they're cut out. They're cut out. And for what reason? So you can get a hard on over it? Don't shame yourself. Don't shame our movement. Don't, don't even call yourself a progressive if that's how you believe. I, I don't want to be a part of that. I'll call that shit out in a heartbeat. That's why we end up getting nowhere because then all of a sudden the Republicans jump back and they go, well, what about the choices you made in your life? You know, you made some bad choices. You shouldn't be getting these things. But that's what Clinton's doing, right? Hey, we're only going to help up to 125. After that, you're still going to be strapped with that debt because that's the way it should be. Sorry, I'm not buying it. That's not progress to me. That's yet another division. And then they'll tell us, well, you don't have anything to worry about. We solved the health care problem by giving you your Obamacare. Really? You're going to tell me that you've given me health care that I can't afford? My prescription medicine is still too high. I can't afford the copay. Because I'm on a bronze plan, I'm stuck with a $5,000 annual deductible. And you're telling me to shut up and eat my peas because you've solved health care. That is the problem with the Democratic Party. They get a little frickin' victory and they want to ride it for another 20 years. Suffer. Shut up and suffer. Just shut up and mind your business. Eat your peas. So, looking back at all the stuff I talked about with the Clintons, and I'm not talking, I didn't go into any crazy Vince Foster stuff. I kept it on the up and up. That doesn't mean that Vince Foster wasn't murdered or whatever. I just didn't go there because it was irrelevant. There's enough real shit to focus on with the Clintons that they destroyed the economy. That's right. They were the ones that destroyed the economy. You can hate W for going to war. He's got a lot to hate him for. But don't blame him. Don't blame him for the economy. That's a Clinton machination. That's a Clinton baby. Go to Progressive Historians. I'll put the link in this afterwards like I often do. And read the history of Bill Clinton and the Glass-Steagall repeal and so forth. I'll also give you an article from Stephanie Kelton where she talks about Brother Bill and his destruction of the U.S. economy with his so-called surplus. When you guys really get what I'm talking about economically, when that light bulb goes on, when you see Occupy Democrats put out one of these stupid memes about Obama reduced the deficit, when you see them put out a stupid meme about unfunded wars and credit cards, when that stuff, when that light bulb turns on and you can start trolling the hell out of those pages and telling them they need to learn some economics, when you start learning that, man, I'm going to be like, whoop, 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 whoop. <laughs> that for me will be victory because that means we're starting to make some progress. Now we can really make some change. So stand with me. Let's keep the Clintons out of the White House at any and all costs. Because, honest to God, those same parasites that will defend Clinton will be the first ones to take to the streets if the Donald or anybody else wanted to take us to war 
wanted to push a fracking bill, wanted to cut food stamps, they would be up in arms. But if Clinton does it, it will be a grand bargain. You don't understand. We had to. The Republicans had a gun to our head. We had no choice. There'll be no sit-ins on the floor of the Senate for food stamps. There'll be no sit-ins on the floor for single payer. There'll be no sit-ins to stop the war. There's only sit-ins when it is good optics. There's no sit-ins for regular stuff. There's no fight in these people. They're go along to get along even with the rubes on the other side. We can't afford Hillary Clinton. We simply cannot afford that. We cannot afford, more importantly, a dull zombie society that literally doesn't challenge their queen, that literally doesn't say anything, that sits there and allows the shit to happen and then calls you a right-wing troll for calling out bullshit. We can't afford those people. Those people are killing our country. I mean, when you talk about killing it, I mean they are killing it. The unthinking, but, but, but. They're killing our country. Whenever you hear them talking about blocking Trump, just remember... Donald Trump to progressives is what bombs are to terrorism in the Middle East. He's like freaking fertilizer, man. Fertilizer for trolls. Fertilizer. That's right. He is probably the only thing left to ignite this revolution, sadly. I will not vote for him. He's a disgusting human being, but he's a prop. Hillary means it. She really wants this. Oh my God, her life won't be complete if she can't be the first woman president. <laughs> Seriously. I mean, dead serious. She's like, she probably gets constipated thinking about it. It's like, oh. And you know what? I am all about breaking that ceiling. I used to be all about Elizabeth Warren, but I know she is a honest to God bona fide sellout. She really sold us down the river. But I do want another woman in there, and that is Jill Stein. Now, if Jill can't get it, I at least want to help them get over the top so that they can get on the debate stage to keep our issues alive and well. I want to be able to give them matching funds so we have four years of preparing to get ready for the next run instead of waiting till the last minute. I want to make sure that we are beating the streets with the Overton window so that there's nobody thinking that health care for all is pie in the sky. That's why I'm going to, every day I get a chance, I'm going to talk about economics so that you guys tell two friends and so on and so on and so on and so on and so on. Because in 2020, I want to make sure that we are able to have our revolution on steroids, ready to spend money like madmen, like drunk sailors. I want to get this country back on its feet. I want true, honest to God, middle class jobs. I keep talking about underwater welding. I know people that are freaking rolling in cash and they're blue collar. They never went to college a day in their life. They learned a trade, and they are making bank. They don't use fancy words. They just go underwater and weld bridges, man. They weld bridges. These guys are making bank, and that's infrastructure spending. We can do it, man. But we can't do it if we allow Clinton, who, if you look, seriously, please trust me on this. She's already talking about we got to cut spending. we gotta, we got to balance. We, she, she used to be a huge balanced budget hawk. Balanced budgets are economic treason. That's right. Economic treason. They take away our ability to react. They take away our ability to absorb shocks in the economy. They take away our ability to react and save the 99%. Because all the other people, they, the, the businesses and stuff, they don't need the protection. They've got enough buffer to survive shocks. We don't. We're paycheck to paycheck, man, hand to mouth. 
When the economy tanks, we tank. Except for a few people who make good decisions. We need an economy that works for all of us. We need an economy that we can believe in and we can rely on and that we don't feel the fear of layoff every five minutes so that we can, I don't know, do something with our kids, go on a field trip with them, chaperone, help them with a Pinewood Derby, go to the kids' softball game, coach the volleyball team, teach an art class with your kids. Parents are not able to do these things because life is too damn hard right now. It really is. When I grew up, my father was able to coach my baseball team. He was able to uh, lead the Boy Scouts and Cub Scouts and Weebelows. My father worked a full-time job, but when he left his job, he was able to be dad. We got to get back to where parents are able to spend time with their kids, where we're able to be families again. And right now, life is too freaking hard. Some of you out there probably leading a pretty charmed existence. Maybe you got your Benz, maybe you got your Lincoln, maybe you got your BMW, your Beamer. And hats off to you. I don't, you know, I don't deprive anybody of good things. But that isn't the case for everyone. We don't all get to go to the Bahamas for a month. We don't all get to go to Cancun, the Isle of Mujeres, to go ahead and have a swim. People should be able to have some downtime. You need to recharge the batteries. We need to organize. We need to work with groups like the Progressive Independent Party who are trying to unite progressives under one umbrella. Keep the tribes together under one umbrella so you can be the people's front of Judea and you can be the Judean people's front. And we can all still work together. And there isn't all this nonsense of bashing, you know, somebody that's slightly not right. They, they, maybe they don't eat a certain way or maybe they don't talk a certain way or whatever. We can all still unite under the big tent and we can make real progress. Anyway. I feel much, much better. This is one of those streams that was more for me than for you. I needed to get that off my chest. So I appreciate you all being my therapist, letting me lay on the couch, let me vent my spleen, and let me feel a little bit lighter than I did when I was ready to strangulate <laughs> the trolls. Come on, guys. I love you. Hey, have a great night. Smoke a bowl. Enjoy your night. Kiss your kids. Talk to you later.